Good afternoon and a welcome to everybody today to the event called Building Trust During Scientific Uncertainty, How Do We Better Respond to Outbreaks? This event is co-sponsored by Aspen Institute's Science and Society Program and Boston University Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. I'm Nahid Bedelia. I'm the founding director of SEED. And our mission here at SEED is to improve societal resilience against the threat of emerging and epidemic infectious diseases pathogens worldwide. We do so by focusing on four pillars, governance, resilience, innovation, and trust. We call it GRIT. We are a research think tank, a capacity strengthening partner, and our work focuses beyond that in providing legislative support, community outreach, and training. Today's event is part of our core pillar of work around how we build trust to respond to public health emergencies such as outbreaks. I'm Aaron Mertz, and I'm the director of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program, which is part of our broader health, medicine, and society program. Science and Society was established in 2019 with the mission to democratize science as a guiding force for public good. We work to elevate public trust in science and to help foster a more diverse and more engaged scientific workforce. To do so, we convene experts in solutions-oriented strategy sessions, mobilize a diverse constituency of science advocates, and implement public outreach efforts and initiatives. The program is grateful for general support from Johnson & Johnson, the Gordon & Betty Moore Foundation, and the Smart Family Foundation of New York. If we could pull up the slide showing the event format, that would be great. The format for today will be rotating conversations between two of our panelists at a time, as illustrated in this image. They will engage with prompt questions and then have a freely flowing conversation for about 12 minutes, at which point I will come on to say that our time is up. Then the first speaker will drop off and will be joined by the next speaker. The pairings continue until speaker four and speaker one converse. Then we will bring all of the panelists back at the end for a question and answer session fielded from the live chat, the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen, screen, and questions submitted in advance during registration. For our first paired conversation, Cassandra Pierre will interview Nahid Bedalia. Dr. Cassandra Pierre is assistant professor at the Boston University School of Medicine medical director of public health programs and the associate hospital epidemiologist at Boston Medical Center and the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Council. Her research is focused on infection prevention in vulnerable populations. Dr. Nahid Bedalia is the founding director of Boston University's Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases and Policy Research, SEED, associate director of the National Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratories, at Boston University. She is an internationally recognized leader in highly communicable and emerging infectious diseases with clinical, field, academic, and policy experience in pandemic preparedness. Thank you both for joining us. Okay. So could you Nahid, talk a little bit about the role of scientific uncertainty in response to emerging infectious diseases? Yeah, Sandra, you and I have actually both faced this, you know, as infectious diseases physicians and those particularly working in infection control. I, I think that what I want to, what we need to sort of think about in terms of information sharing, particularly about emerging infectious diseases outbreaks, is that as we learn about novel pathogens, the knowledge base increases as we respond to an outbreak. And our response to the SARS-CoV-2 infections as well as COVID-19 pandemic are a perfect example of that. Often what you see is that the first hundred patients increase our knowledge about both the disease as well as how to both better take care of them and how we can improve and refine public health policy around it. But that very sort of distinction, right, that building of scientific consensus over time, which is built on existing knowledge about viruses and bacteria, but then can can sort of alter, you know, as an outbreak goes on, sometimes leads to difficulties in communicating to the public, particularly as recommendations need to be changed as, as there is, you know, evolving evidence. The other parts that make it difficult is that with novel pathogens, we often, um, you know, have to wait until we have diagnostics that are, can, can tell us how big a problem is, until we can have therapeutics and vaccines that are evolving and we're sort of assessing their both their efficacy and their safety. 
And so just even the response and the shape of the response changes over the arc of a pandemic. And so this inherent things, you know, in some ways there are integral things to sort of responding to novel pathogens that are similar to every other health emergency. You know, when things are fast moving, it's hard to get information out to in, in, a, in an equitable way, in a way that sort of doesn't feed into confusion, that doesn't leave space open for, you know, malicious uh, intent potentially to spread this information. But novel pathogens in particular are difficult because, because there is that inherent um, difference in, in terms of gathering data as we respond to them. Just out of curiosity, what is your thought about how knowledge of the scientific process plays out to that, even beyond just thinking about you know, the, the shape and the arc of the pandemic itself? Well, the, the, the difficult thing is, you know, there are pathogens that we've, that there is, first there is the, we get answers to questions we ask. And, and what do I mean by that? And I think it might be getting to the heart of what you're asking as well, which is, which is there is that shape, you know, the shape of the response changes, but, but there are diseases that we've known about for decades, like Ebola virus disease. And we are still learning about basic features, you know, such as, for example, we just discovered that there is, um, because of better, you know, laboratory infrastructure in areas where Ebola virus disease is endemic, we are just discovering that there is a small, small portion of survivors who may be able to pass on the disease even years after survival. And that's the disease that we've known about, about for decades, right? This is compared to SARS-CoV-2 that we've only known about for two years. And so a lot of times this, you know, attainment of scientific information is, is limited also by the infrastructure that we have put into place to find the answers. You can't find things you don't look for, you know, and, and that's where elements of equity, I think, sort of come into play. But also they reveal the importance of why we need to have that capability and infrastructure in different parts of the world um, for us all as a globe to be prepared. Um, because our biggest blind spots, I think, are, are the fact that, you know, we don't pick up these threats partly because it's just the research capacity, but also at the tail end of a lot of infectious diseases surrounds are communities that don't have access to care. I know half the world doesn't have access to essential healthcare. So that our inquiry stops at that point, if you will. And just thinking through, um, you know, what the, you know, we talked about this before, um, you know, thinking about how we've had to go through multiple iterations. Uh, it feels like this is a time where people have had to get degrees in pharmacology and uh, public health and immunology. Um, I, I do wonder too about the, the thought that even just, you know, the scientific process itself evolving so rapidly, going down multiple alleys that are sometimes blind. Um, does it, I mean, and also feeling like years of, of research are compressed into two weeks. Um, do we think that like, are we expecting too much in terms of what we, and, and how we message um, about, about this, these changing epidemics? Um, is, is the way that we message about them, does that need to change? Yeah. I. I... I think that's a couple of things, right? It, it's all, it's what we share and how we how we create capacity as a society for people to be able to sort of understand elements of scientific uncertainty, you know. And and so we've uh, the there's you know more and more statistics about how our our investment in in public scientific sort of knowledge and and basic principles of uh, statistics as well as, you know, public health or infection control could aid future responses to this. Um, but, but you're right, inherently, there's going to be compli complicated issues that even those of us who are, you know, experts within our field sometimes feel like this is just drinking from a fire hose. There's a lot of evidence that's coming out. And that's where I think there's an element of you know, do we trust the people who share the information with us? And which, I, which is why I think events like this is a, this are important because it's not just about the knowledge, it's not just about the mode of sharing, but I also do think a bit of that is, can you take somebody else? Whose word are you taking if there's a fast moving emergency and there's a lot of data that's changing who is sort of the, the, your, you know, your, your person, your sort of, you know, public health expert or your information source that you trust enough to be able to digest that information. So I do think it's, it's beyond just that scientific uncertainty. I think it has to do with um, 
and public knowledge about science and and you know and accept and and understanding new concepts that are coming up. But I, I do think it's sort of also there's an element of this about how much where I guess how much people trust other sources and where they go go to that those sources for information. Thanks, Judy. I'm going to read a question from the Q and A. I'm uh, trying to communicate with society. Many scientists speak about believing in science, quote unquote. This is a religious statement. It does not help. Trust in science is something totally different. How do the panelists prefer to explain the difference? Oh, I am so glad you asked that question because I become uncomfortable when people say trust in science because exactly as you said, in my mind as a scientist, the process of science is accumulation of data and consensus building. Um, and so almost when you say trust in science, you are pitting it against trust and belief, which, you know, and so those things become equal. Um, that's the distinction is that science is through gathering of data, through repetition of experiments, coming to the same conclusion and hence building a consensus around what in that moment is the most likely reflection of, of the best practices, of the best knowledge that we have available. Um, and, and so I, I, I think when people say, in my mind, when people say trust in science, they, they, they're referring to maybe trust in the scientific enterprise, the, the methodology for us to get better answers rather than, than, a, you know, than a process that is not based on evidence generation. And I think some part of that also refers to maybe saying trust in the public health leadership of the country or, or whoever else they're sort of referring to. They're referring to uh, the, the bodies themselves who are sharing the information rather than science, the disciplines, you know, that sort of go into that building that evidence. I don't know. What do you think, Cassandra? Yeah, would you no, agree I, with I, that? Yeah. I would agree. I would say science is not a book that has been written. Yeah. It's not the Bible. Um, so um, the other thing too, when I hear trust in science, even though, you know, I feel like, you know, we follow the scientific process, we follow yeah. the evidence where it leads us, and I do believe in that. I think for many people, trust in science also conjures up this very negative connotation, thinking about um, what has been done to get that science, thinking about, um, you know, what it's meant to practice evidence-based medicine. There are a lot of people who have had to suffer for that purpose. We know yeah. historically, globally, um, when we think about different, you know, you know how we've come up with our current obstetric science, um, what we've done to figure out about thresholds of pain. Many people have had to suffer for that. We have sometimes, um, our practices are, are built about on um, marginalization um, and trauma inflicted on others. So I think for other people too, science, um, sure, could be another false god, but it could also be somewhat sinister when you think about it that way. So. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's interesting because, you know, the. It, it, that's true, and the other part of, of trust in science that makes me uncomfortable is that there, are, you know, definitely elements of the scientific and in institutions currently that are still not equitable. You know, not all researchers' voices or questions are represented, you know, or funded in the same way. We talk about trying to introduce diversity of voices and diversity of backgrounds in NIH-funded researchers, and and you know, ensuring that there is diversity of workforce in, in the scientific sort of. Uh, you know, inquiry group and, and so science institutions tend to fail. But I think when people, I, I, you know, to me, trust in science at least refers not to trust blindly all information that scientists give you, it's to trust in the process that when a consensus has happened and an evidence base has been created, that the data in front of us, which is now supported by many different sources, is a better path forward compared to one that's based simply on belief, I suppose. I agree. I would love to delve more into that, but um, I know we don't have much time left, and I wanted to get through one last one. So, how do we uh, this, uh, how do we correct for minimize the import of politics on building scientific consensus from a discourse in both high and low resource settings? The political decisions and the implications thereof sound louder than the science. Yeah, and, and Dr. Ayabare was asking this question, you know, he and I have, um, thank you for that question. He's, he's a researcher based in Uganda, you know, and, and this is a perfect question of um, the diseases that get studied are diseases that are important to those who have the resources to fund that research, right? And we try to sort of, there is, you know, the, tons of organizations, NIH, others have tried to work on increasing training capacity in, in other countries. We've tried to sort of, you know, 
but there isn't equity in, in terms of what Dr. Ivory is talking about, which is which is having people from different economic backgrounds and in, in, you know recent committed settings also setting the research agenda. And that's that's wherein I think it also is limited. It's it's the sin of you know omission of that that viewpoint of of that that trust in science, but then if science is only concentrating on answers that are important to a certain group of people, you know, is science representative of 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 the answers that we could have of, is that process, not so much science, but it's the process representative of equity. Um, I, I think the difference though is that for the general public who's listening, I think the big thing is, you know, as you're looking through this, the way that I sort of try to answer to to figure out what the best the best data on something is, is, is to see if multiple sources of data have shown the same thing. And if an opinion, a scientific opinion is developed, if you see that 99% of the people in science, you know, public health experts, scientists, physicians are in one potential uh, camp and you have a very small minority in another, that's also a hint that majority of the people are looking at the same data and coming to a result that that might be a path that potentially um, may reflect the body of the, the current knowledge. Uh, so I know we're running out of, of time as well. Um, so I'm gonna actually turn, Chandra, thank you for that. I'm gonna turn to Lee McIntyre, who I think is the next uh, person yes. on there. Uh, yep. Thank you, Cassandra. We're gonna bring Lee McIntyre on now. And Dr. McIntyre is a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and the author of the books, Post-Truth, the Scientific Attitude, and How to Talk to a Science Denier. And Dr. Bedalia will interview him now. Dr. McIntyre, I am so excited to have you in this conversation because, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll help me both as a physician who's, who's, you know, answering questions and patients in my offices, but also to help others who might be listening and who who've have similar questions, you know, and, and really the, the prompt is how do we take all these inherent challenges that Dr. Pierre and I talked about and strike this healthy balance between, uh, you know, skepticism of new data and then getting enough consensus to have a meaningful action, particularly when you have a fast moving public health emergency like a pandemic. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's my honor to, uh, to be here and to speak with you, uh, you all. Um, look, scientists, uh, scientists deal with that balance all the time. Scientists are skeptical. Uh, they have questions, they have doubts, but they overcome those doubts through gathering evidence. And then when the doubts are answered, then you know scientific consensus can come forward, but always with the proviso that you can then change your mind again based on future evidence. I mean, that's uh, what I wrote about on the scientific attitude. I think that's just how science works. So I think that the challenge is not for how scientists balance skepticism and consensus, because you all do that pretty well. The problem is the public perception of that process, because I think that the, the public doesn't really understand how science works. And so when uncertainty gets played out in public, especially when it's life and death stakes and it's happening really fast for something like a pandemic, um, people get confused. Because I think that most people, even people who trust in science, think that science is about proof. But science is not about proof. Science is about likelihood given the evidence. And so if people think that it's about proof and then you change your mind, then there's trouble. So how do we, you know, I, I and I completely agree with you. I, I think that the, the maybe some of the distrust that public has in, in the scientific enterprise, you know, comes from that, that changing data. The, the, how do we as public health practitioners or public health organizations? How do we communicate when the data is changing so quickly? What would be a better way for us to talk about what the current state of data is without, you know, it's so interesting. You and I just were talking before the event about the communicating these types of complex ideas within two and a half minutes, you know, on, on media spots. You can't do it. So how do we communicate about a particular life or death situation and which also has uncertainty, but maybe not so much uncertainty that, right. you know, nothing is known, just enough uncertainty that we may not know the granular yeah. details of something. So, and, and how do you share that? How do you, communi yeah. you communicate that in the, in the appropriate way? I mean, you put your finger on exactly the, the thing. It's the, you know, the topic we're all talking about today. It's this, uh, this question of trust, because 
I think that the way to address it is to lean into the idea of uncertainty. Don't be afraid to communicate uncertainty. I mean, scientists and, and physicians, you're not afraid of uncertainty. You deal with it all the time and you understand it. But somehow when the, uh, when the hot lights are on and people are criticizing, it's very tempting even for scientists to overstate and claim that something is proven when it's not. And that's deadly because then when people change their mind, um, the public's reaction is, oh, so were you lying before or are you lying now? But right. that's simply how, uh, how science works. So my best advice is that uh, scientists um, who have the right values about this, I mean, they are changing their mind on the basis of evidence. What else would you have them do? Uh, I think that the, the best thing is to lean into it, embrace uncertainty, explain why it's important to change your mind on the basis of evidence. And I think the other thing um, that's, again, hard to do when we're getting criticized, you know, publicly and worse sometimes, is to express the humility that scientists have, the humility to be able to change your mind on the basis of evidence, to be able to say, we thought this was true, uh, and it turned out not to be true. And, you know, to me, you know, what happens is the, the public has questions. And I think that they don't quite understand that scientists have questions too. But scientists' response to those questions is, let's go to the data, let's do some experiments, and let's figure this out. And, some, and at the end of that process, I think it's important to express not just what you found, but how you found it, you know, mm -hmm. the road that you took to get there. So, you know, I, I'm thinking of a, a focus group that the po GOP fo pollster uh, Frank Luntz had to try to find just the right message on COVID. The winning message was, and I, I forget the name of the fellow, but he, he you know, somebody who is a, uh, he was an epidemiologist, a scientist, who was so humble. And, you know, he, he said, uh, you know, basically, look, here's, we don't know everything. But here's what we do know. And here's why we think that we know that based on the data. And here's what we still don't know and what we'd like to learn, but here's what we're doing about that. So it was kind of the attitude that he used, you know, just the, the attitude of embracing uncertainty, expressing humility. I think that, again, that's hard to do in, in an environment in which you just feel like you're giving ammunition to somebody to attack you. But what I found in my own research, talking to science deniers, which is, you know, what I did in preparation for my book, is that humility, embracing uncertainty actually increases trust, because it humanizes you in an environment in which you're being attacked, you know, as liars, you know, all the disinformation, and it, it, it humanizes you and it shows that you're trustworthy people, which you are. So question for you, Lee, and I think, you know, you and Clint will be talking about this in a little bit anyway, but I, here's my, my dilemma is not to, you know, I'm as event for anybody who's probably heard me speak about this. I often go into the weeds more often than they would like me to, you know, because <laughs> there's, that's, that's the professor in me, but, but this idea that, you know, it's, it's not so much, but, but those are great lessons. It's not so much that it's, it's this worry that if, you know, are we, um, after you present all that stuff, what I've found is that people are asking me, well, then what do you want me to do? You know, what is the answer? And, 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 and you know, generally it's, yeah. it's following up with an, a course of action. And what's difficult, right, as a science community or as a scientist in this environment is that if I present all this stuff, which a lot of times I don't even get a chance to do in, in the venues that I may speak right. about them. But, but then if I get to this, you know, and hence on this da data, I recommend you do this what's happening is that there there are you know actors there are disinformation you know misinformation yes, agents that's right. who are basically saying well look you know you can't be certain of the recommendation this person just made they themselves admitted that they have no certainty around this rather than saying there's some uncertainty there's like extremism there's a black and white and and it, that's a hard thing to sort of navigate as someone who's trying to um get public health, you know, activities yes. on the ground happening to protect populations. So how do we, yeah. how do we balance that? It's, it's a, it's a very tough question because it's, it's a tough issue to do. You're, because you're not only trying to convince people who might be confused, you're con trying to convince people who are confused because they're being lied to by someone mm -hmm. else. Yeah. People who are telling them that they shouldn't trust a word out of your mouth. And so you're not only communicating information, you're trying to get them to trust you at the uh, at the same time, and so it is. 
it is very difficult to, uh, to get that right. Um, I think that, I mean, some people do just want to be told what to do. You know, they want to know what's the conclusion. Uh, to me, the, you know, the amazing thing about, about science, the reason that it's so successful as it is, is not because it can offer proof or certainty, but because it offers probability and likelihood based on the evidence. So even to express things in terms of probability helps. The example that I think of here is, you know, the person who always says, well, you know, can you prove to me that climate change is real? You know, do you, you don't even have a hundred percent consensus amongst the scientists. So, you know, maybe I'm right. Well, then you read that uh, Reuters just reported that uh, the confidence interval for anthropogenic climate change is five sigma, which is a million to one. Well, that's pretty good probability. So if you present it as it's proven, and then the person comes back with, oh, no, it's not, and they can name some scientist who disagrees, then you're on the defensive. But if you present it with, well, we're not 100% certain, but it's a million to one, that, that makes it a little clearer. And, and I think that sometimes, it's funny sometimes because I, I love watching the epidemiologists, the public health officials, because they're so scrupulous and trying so hard to, to, you know, to do the right thing. But sometimes the explanations, uh, you know, make it difficult for the public to, as you said, to hear what they need to know. And sometimes that message is, it's overwhelmingly likely, more likely that you're going to, uh, you know, get sicker if you have COVID than if you have you know, the vaccine. Yes, it's possible for there to be vaccine injury, but it's so exceedingly rare that if you compare the two, this is what's most likely to happen. And I mean, people do that. Sometimes other people don't listen, but I, I always get nervous when I hear language around proof and certainty, and I get happier when I hear scientists expressing language around probability and likelihood, because that removes that moment when you have to say, whoops, we changed our mind. There's some interesting questions uh, from a couple of attendees that I'm going to try to roll into one because sure. I think they go into the same theme. Um, so one is this idea of, you know, how do we, which I think we at SEED and also Aspen are trying to do, which is this idea of imparting um, and sharing, as you said, both the process, but I think that mm -hmm. what we need to do is potentially also see ourselves as, you know, as, as, ambassadors of, well, and this is what, what we mean when we say probability, this is right. what it means, you know, That's this idea right. of addressing maybe lower literacy around those concepts in the general public, while we're also sharing the information, we should see that potentially uh, as, as something that we do as a part of how we explain the method. So that's one part. There's a question about how we sort of, you know, look to address through media and others on, on, you know, adults who may not have literacy in those issues. But the other question, which I thought was important, was it seems to me a false dichotomy that there is such an us versus them of scientists versus experts, public, and who knows the science based on argument of leaning into uncertainty. How can we recognize the knowledge of the lived experience along with the knowledge of the scientific process? So one thing I will discern that is that there is the, you know, when we say lived experience, I, I think that there is, there is, there is a struggle because I, I, science does need to be humble to be able to hear the signal yes. from the noise. And long COVID, for example, is a good example of many patients coming out and saying, there's a phenomenon, listen to us, there's something going on. And then, you know, scientists sort of working to try to understand that. But then that's different, right? I mean, how do we, how, when we talk about the lived experience, like how do we discern between that idea that science needs to listen to, well, my one anecdote is the same as your 3 million people, you know, like there's side effects database for vaccine. How do we sort of balance, make that balance between the two? I, I, again, it's, it, it's hard because you, you want to listen to people because it's the humane thing to do, but also because sometimes they can tell you things that are also data that, you know, even if it hasn't been in a controlled experiment, you hear the same thing from, uh, from people over and over. And it, uh, you know you you have to take it seriously. I I just think in general that the more people feel heard, the more they build trust. And when and trust is destroyed, when people uh, you know when the experts say I'm an expert, do what I yeah. say because I'm the expert and you're not. So I mean even if you're right, and even if they would in other circumstances do that, that's the wrong thing to say. Now very few people say it that way or, or even, you know, uh, even come close to putting it that way. But I think that there's also the fact that uh, 
those sorts of pronouncements are kind of made with a megaphone. So even <laughs> when Dr. Fauci is being as careful as he can possibly be, it sounds to people like, you know, he's telling them what to do and, and they get angry about it. So it's, uh, it's hard. I mean, my work is to increase literacy of how science actually works, because I think that if more people understood how science works, there, there would be fewer problems like this. Um, and I think that most science denial happens because people don't know scientists. I think that if more people had actually met scientists, they would trust scientists more. It's when they're getting the disinformation and they don't have anybody that they trust who's a scientist to check in with, then they're lost. That might be a good transition to the next conversation. Thank you. Now okay. we'll bring on Clint Watts. He is a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and non-resident fellow at the Alliance for Securing Democracy. He's also president of Myborough Solutions and the author of Messing with the Enemy, Surviving in a World of Hackers, Terrorists, Russians, and Fake News. And Dr. McIntyre will interview him now. Well, it's such a pleasure to uh, be able to, uh, to interview you because um, as I, I told you before the event started, I, I see you on MSNBC and you scare the hell out of me every time because you seem to, uh, uh, to know so much about misinformation and disinformation, which I think is a key to this. So my first question to you is, uh, misinformation and disinformation are changing the environment and ability for the general public to get reliable data in an outbreak or a health crisis. How do you see this evolving? How much do you think that these sorts of factors have determined the course of the pandemic? Well, thanks for having me in and thanks for that question. It, it is, um, I, I'll summarize and over summarize to a degree the, the challenge, which is you will routinely hear people argue it's because of social media we're in this problem. You've, you've even heard President Biden mention Facebook in particular at times, um, but that's not entirely fair. It is part of the problem. And it's also one that's not going back in, into the, the genie's not going back to the bottle. We're not going to get rid of social media. So that's one part of it. So it's one part the algorithm, but the other part of it is us. And, and we oftentimes don't evaluate internally how people receive information. And it's been interesting having worked in the military and out of the military and overseas and here during the war on terror and more recently on election influence and now COVID is that the human mind was not meant to see and evaluate five hours of social media content a day. So at no point in human history has there been this burden where you have to take in so much of information and so quickly and then rapidly assess all that information and make a decision about whether to share it and be correct 100% of the time. And you've got an algorithm that helps deliver that. that that's an impossible expectation. We can't expect people to bat a thousand they don't in normal conversations, but there's a different dynamic, right? If we were to go into a group at work or school or with family or at a religious setting, we might say something and people would say, I don't think that's correct because, you know, I was there and that's not what happened. And you would change your opinion. There is a, a, there is a hurdle that happens in the social media world that's easily passed over that's much more difficult, and that's called rebuttal. Now, there's several things about it. Um, social media is designed to give you content that you like from people that look like you and talk like you anytime you want. So that's confirmation bias, implicit bias, availability bias. You add all those three together, that's an information death star as, as if we want to use a Star Wars reference, right? And so how do we manage that? Well, we can help people be better and we can help the companies and social media companies, the information environment be better. It's really a multi-part solution. It has absolutely been worse this time around because of the speed at which information moved and that the messenger uh, today, as opposed to, to 1985, I, I like to say, you know, Dr. Fauci was around in 1985. When he would go to a podium, he would communicate out and that would be communicated out through the news and it would be evaluated, but that would be it. Today, everyone is their own messenger. Everyone's their own printing press. And so it's a volume problem that it's going to be really challenging for us to ever overcome, but we can improve the system collectively if we understand how information moves. At how? What? What would be? What would be maybe the the most important thing that we could be to do to uh, be proactive against this kind of threat that you're talking about? 
So I think you made an important uh, distinction at the start, which is misinformation versus yes. disinformation. So that oftentimes isn't understood. Misinformation is uh, incorrect or false information that's shared by people without them knowing or understanding that it's false. Uh, what I tend to call crazy uncle emails we used to get at a slower pace, you know, 10 years ago, we, we used to always joke that we have a family member, right, that shares something with us and people would take a Snopes or a fact rebuttal, right, and they would push back on them, but it still was like a small problem. Now with Facebook, that's on steroids. So that's one part of the problem. Separately though, it's disinformation. These are people that deliberately push out false information with an intended objective to deceive an individual or an audience for some specific purpose. That is much more dangerous because very effective disinformation creates a cascading effect with highly algorithmic explosive misinformation to where the two in combination are, have an escalating effect. And we saw that during what we call the infodemic with the pandemic, which yep. was when you are scared, when you're angry, um, you tend to believe information soon thereafter that may, may be false and you're more likely to because you have a bio, a physiological reaction to that information. It's a survival instinct. So you might remember there were crazed text, text messages about the National Guard being deployed around the country and lockdowns, and that created price surging and runs on materials and all sorts of things, right? All of those amplifying effects, in addition to the health problems, uh, really show the power of disinformation, which is whoever can move quick and be voluminous uh, in their messaging and be in a closed environment in terms of their messaging and not be rebutted in a timely fashion, right. which is very difficult for, for exports. If you are fast, most trusted source, no rebuttal, you can really cause damage to a society. And I think we see that both with COVID-19 response and with vaccines, the burden placed on doctors and medical experts yeah. has been enormous uh, to write the truth. So a couple of things. One is algorithmic testing and being aware on the disinformation front of what you would call the, the top 1% uh, of disinformation peddlers. If you know who they are, don't try and police everything. We did this in crime and you know, terrorism and other things. Yeah. Just focus on those that are putting out the most and most prolifically. Separately, then, can you use the algorithms to advance truth against those by creating the rebuttal? And you're seeing a lot of the companies do that now. They will put up links. It doesn't solve the problem alone. There's no silver bullet. But we're starting to identify technological, algorithmic ways that we can start to mm -hmm. advance the truth against falsehoods. And I think that's a really positive sign. It's It's been too late, but at least we're moving in the right direction. I, I, I like that idea very much because the, the, the disinformation question, I think, has been vastly underestimated with uh, with COVID. Uh, people don't realize that uh, quite a bit of the uh, uh, disinformation, uh, you know, making its way out that you know that becomes dis misinformation because people are passing it along unwittingly, has been from Russian intelligence. It has, you know, they are deliberately uh, putting stories in, like that one in the uh, Oriental Review in April 2020 right. about the microchips in the vaccines. People don't realize that that story was was pushed created by Russian intelligence, put forward in their English language uh, arm, and then uh, taken up very quickly. I mean, within a month, 44% of uh, Republicans and something like 25% of the American people thought that that was true. So I, I like very much the idea about focusing not just on the information, but on who's making the disinformation, you know, getting to that top 1%, as you say, but of course, you can't get the disinformers to stop creating disinformation. Right. So what's the pinch point? What, what do, you, do you just deplatform them? Do you identify them? I remember that study from the Center for Countering Digital Hate that, you know, 65% of the anti-vax propaganda on Twitter was due to 12 people. Do you identify right. those people and just deplatform them? Is that sufficient? Or is there some other way to, um, you know, cut the head off for, of the disinformation? So that's, that's the number one action you can take, which is focus on the most prolific and, and raise the cost for them to create yeah. that content on such scale. I think that's the first thing. Okay. And so the second part, I think, is also understanding what the objectives are, because different objectives lead to different disinformation peddlers. Fake cures is its own business and industry. And so if you want to battle that, that's a criminal model, right, that you need to pursue. There are there's litigation, there's law enforcement actions that you can take. That might be a more 
uh, successful way to keep free speech going, which we do want, mm -hmm. but also pursue different kinds of peddlers. At the nation state level, it definitely is the platforming. And so I can tell you three areas in particular, the one you mentioned, Oriental Review, about microchips, uh, 5G technology, and yep. uh, in terms of a bioweapon, all three of those narratives were prolifically advanced by Russian disinformation yep. and amplified or just duplicated by China and some other actors. And so in those cases, it is literally going after them and trying to squelch their ability to produce. It gets more difficult in the social political context. And that's where it gets really dicey because we're constantly battling the, how do we maintain a free and open environment for information, which is very right. much about our democracy with how do we also keep people from being harmed, right? So one of my big things that I push for academia right now is, can you focus on measuring public harms from false information? I would love only really research institutes and universities can do that. Um, my team is mostly hunting, uh, you know, actors that are doing this or trying to help algorithms be improved. But it's very difficult to do when you can't measure the harm. So what is yelling fire in a movie theater and social media? Right. What is that equivalent? I think with vaccines, that case can be made pretty easily. Like this has been very damaging in terms of our uptake of vaccines, which has led to deaths. You can see it in certain places or in terms of COVID cases and response in other places. So I'm hoping we can get to that where we can mm -hmm. make better and informed regulatory and legislative decisions around what should be policed in social media. But that way, I think we can collectively make that judgment that a democracy should make. So, so it, it's, I mean, really what you're saying is that it's an information war. It's not just, this is not happening by accident. This is not just, you know, something that somebody woke up one day and wondered if there were microchips in their vaccines. This is being pushed sometimes for political or ideological reasons, sometimes for financial reasons, you know, in the case of the false cures and things. And that I, I like what you said there that in some cases we can go after the criminal model, but I'm intrigued, especially with all the uh, military paraphernalia on the wall there. How does the, when the US military is in an information war, are there tools that they use that we could use domestically, but for our social, political, cultural um, uh, hesitancy to do it. That is, I'm just wondering if there are things that we could be doing that we're not doing, that we could take a page from how information war works in the military. So I do believe there are some principles. I, you know, the military, at least the US military is not very good at information warfare, to be honest. They have a lot more limitations than the authoritarians they go against. Uh, speaking truth, you know, authorities influencing only foreign audiences, uh, the mechanisms by which they do things, all much tougher. But I think there are some important principles that can be learned. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way we've come to adjust our institutions to communicate as if it's 1985 and we keep trying to do that. So uh, one would be, you got to say something. <laughs> so. The U.S. government, you know, as an institution, um, when, when they say something, they tend to be slow, they tend to be very rigid, and they try and go through a set number of messengers. In today's social media environment, if I was looking at it from a military information warfare kind of perspective, we would need a massive increase in the number of messengers and trusted messengers that speak a lot, number one to look like and talk like the target audience. And I've actually worked on some programs in the US that have taken us, which is like, we don't need a press conference. What we need is a social media influence person at a local level that can speak that trusted source like you talked about during your yeah. segment to the local population in a way that you are in the local environment, but do it in 30 seconds. It doesn't have to be a major press conference. Um, separately, we just have to have more messages. And, and I always use the joke in a military audience, which is on what day did Coke and Pepsi stop advertising? And you'll see the sort of blank stare. And I say they never did because the moment you stop messaging, you start losing. It's, it is literally an availability bias sort of phenomenon. So I think just getting the message out there more and th that we can't just think the truth is going to take yeah. off virally, like you have to keep repeating over and over yeah. again. And I think we've gotten better as the pandemic has gone on with that respect. I could talk forever, but we've run out of time. Uh, on to the, the next pairing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to bring Dr. Pierre back to be interviewed by Clint Watts.
Dr. Pierre, I'm thrilled to be on a panel and be the only non-doctor because I get to listen to all the people that are much smarter than me. And so uh, thanks for giving me a chance uh, to interview you. I have, uh, over the last two years, done a lot of tracking of misinformation and disinformation. But at the same point, there are valid concerns in the audiences that we communicate with about how you can trust or, or bridge uh, over time decades of disenfranchisement of certain communities in terms of the information they hear and how they have been treated by the medical system. In particular with African-American communities, the track record is not good you know, in the United States in, in some places. And there are valid reasons to not necessarily trust the medical community or trust the information they get. What have you seen over the last couple of years in terms of how do we build bridges to restore trust to some of these communities that, you know, have good reason to be skeptical oftentimes in terms of the information that they hear. Absolutely. Thanks for that question. I appreciate it. I also appreciated learning um, uh, other diseases in which this information has played a role. But um, I, I would say, you know, actually just to pick up where you left off, I think that one of the things that is, has been clear is that we do need volume of information and messages we need to outcompete um, in terms of what people are hearing. But there's a couple of other things. One is who is delivering messaging? Who are they? We know that um, just as in health, who is delivering the message? Who has a stake in the health of the community? Who looks like the people that are being served? Um, plays a really important role in um, you know, rooting and centering messages and gaining acceptance. Um, and so, if these, if the people that are doing the messaging, whether they be public health officials, scientists, doctors, or local leaders, have an invested interest or part of that community, let that community speak the same language, but also treat the community with respect, treat that population with respect, listens to them, understands the barriers, um, and has shared consequences from outcomes, that is a powerful and beneficial thing. Um, and uh, that that who is also, you know, also extends over to the where people are getting their messaging. So we know that um, public health medical systems have not been doing a great job of diversification and dissemination of information. So um, in addition to thinking about volume, we also need to think about where we're putting our messaging. So sure, we should and can do print media, we can do t TV, we can do conventional radio, but we should also be doing satellite and also, um, you know, advertising on the Haitian radio station that my grandfather used to listen to, um, and so many other, and social media, of course, and so many other platforms that we can think of and haven't yet. Sometimes I think jokingly of, you know, maybe there should be a news hour on the uh, uh, multiplayer video game platform sometimes, but um, there are lots of other places that we can think of um, and should think of to do this. Um, invoking and, and having trusted messengers that are community leaders, I've mentioned that in passing, is, is just going to be really important, I think, on an ongoing basis, um, if we've learned anything from this pandemic. Um, so those who are community activists, religious leaders, people who uh, may play a role in civic organizations, um, and are noted and recognized to be linchpins in communities, do need to be courted, engaged, and again, treated with respect. Um, because as we build a trust as we are public health institutions, we do need a little bit of a shorthand. Um, and many institutions have relied on, on these community organizations and leaders who have really delivered in terms of doing a lot of the work already in translating information messages, delivering goods like PPE to their communities at a time where there was a vacuum um, that uh, public health and, and medicine may not have been filling. Um, so those are some of the things I think of. So throughout the last couple of years, I'm, I'm sure you've seen lots of different messages and messengers and looking at the vulnerable communities that are out there. Is there anything in particular that you would recommend to someone as a messenger? Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a doctor, you know, you've been in this field, but you've also watched others message. Any tips or pointers that you would offer to people when they're thinking about how to engage, you know, at a local level or with a vulnerable community that is right to have some sort of skepticism, but at the same point, desperately needs some of these interventions? So I think it's really important to understand the context and the history of the community that you're speaking to. Um, you know, I think a lot of our structurally marginalized communities, whether it be black or brown or experiencing homelessness, have trauma, experienced trauma in the setting of medical care, public health, or just in the system in general. 
Um, and so, you know, thinking about black and brown communities, the toll of systemic racism is not just an artifact of the Tuskegee experiments or other remote historical traumas. They are being enacted today. People are experiencing systemic racism in many different spaces in the medical community. And so um, we do need to address that, I think. I think it's important to say, you know, we know that this is, that you have experienced trauma, that you have earned uh, distrust. Um, and um, there are concerns about, um, you know, the intent and the messaging. Um, so I think just acknowledging that, you know, and, and thinking through the longer process, eventually, hopefully, of truth and also reconciliation, acknowledging what has happened in these communities to these communities and currently going on in these communities to, to ensure people understand that there is acknowledgement of that. But at least acknowledging that history and that understanding is important. Um, and you know, I think, again, making sure that the tone is appropriate, not paternalistic, and more collaborative in terms of thinking through, you know, what are the barriers? What are you seeing? What are your concerns while shaping and responding um, to that and crafting a message. Um, this is not the time to say, you know, we know best. Um, this is what you need to do. Um, as you say, there's earned distrust um, for the messaging, the message. Um, and um, again, when we talk about the first discussion, trust the science, many people have had or experienced or, or have, you know, their, um, in their mind that the science has actually been um, a malevolent force potentially um, in their history or their lives. And so, um, it needs to be um, a situation where we are actively engaging with our community, again, potentially with messengers that um, represent that community and with trusted leaders who already have, uh, are committed and, and have a stake in that community as well. The other thing I guess I would say is that we know that the communities um, that have, for this pandemic, borne the brunt um, of death, hospitalization, infections, and probably unless things change will continue to bear the brunt of infectious or evolving infections. Um, it's no mistake that these are communities that are experiencing this. We know that there are lots of structural um, and societal um, impediments, barriers that have been placed um, by, you know, what we think of redlining in terms of um, taking away um, ability to improve housing, causing multi-generational housing in situations where there's lack of access to healthcare, um, transportation, um, quality jobs, and food security. So we knew that these were going to be areas where people were going to experience poor health outcomes um, and currently undergo, you know, experience chronic toxic stress um, and have underlying health conditions that put them at risk for poor health outcomes. So thinking through partnership with the community doesn't just mean thinking about prevention, the therapeutics that we can offer, the messaging. It also means enabling people to access those things at a very basic level, right? So when we think about our messaging for isolation and quarantine um, for people who are infected or exposed to COVID-19, um, there wasn't a lot of conversation about how that would work for people who lived in multi-generational households where they were, or families that shared um, a studio apartment. Um, what are the resources that can be put in place to support that isolation and quarantine? How will you get masks to people if they lack the digital access to buy them online and are not finding them in their local stores? Um, how will you get people to mass vaccination sites um, in areas that they're unfamiliar with and have no idea how to get to and they have transportation? So I think there's a couple of things to think about at the very basic level. But the other thing is in terms of like maybe uh, partnership plus, um, is thinking through removing some of those barriers um, in general um, that lead to those poor health outcomes and thinking about equitable access and outcomes. And that's a much longer process, um, but uh, I'll, I'll end there for now. Okay. Well, I have one more question as we kind of wrap up, which was, uh, you know, in terms of vulnerable communities uh, that we're trying to treat, but also a community that's become vulnerable more and more in terms of messaging, which is you, doctors, you know, and medical professionals. It's been remarkable for me. I, I've had the opportunity to go on MSNBC and it used to be we went in person. It was usually a lawyer and some national security people, right? And doctors have taken over a role in terms of messaging across the country, local doctors, local medical officials. What is it we can provide or create a structural system for to help them be better at it? It's not easy to be a local messenger, you know, out into society and other communities. I've seen a lot of changes over the last year and a half to two years, but 
anything, any big takeaways for you as a medical professional in terms of how you had to become a communicator? How do you think about communicating? And are there ways we can do better to help support you as well? Well, uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think, you, as you say, it's been kind of whirlwind. You know, we're still balancing clinic and uh, a lot of our other responsibilities have come back in this time period. Um, right. You know, even though we cleared the decks initially just to focus on COVID. And so even though the rate of uh, advances in information is a bit slower, um, you know, we still I think there are some times where we don't have necessarily information that might help support what we're recommending. So I think about the disinformation that you talked about, for example. Right. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's hard to really uh, be whack-a-mole to think about every rumor or myth or disinformation campaign and thinking about tra tracing it back to its source. But I think sometimes it's helpful just to be aware of what's in the community, what people are hearing, what the concerns are that are being circulated on social media. Because sometimes when people come up to you and say, hey, I heard they were magnets, it's, it's helpful just to be right. prepared for those kinds of things that might occur. Um, and I think it just... Um, in, in terms of media, I think, I think actually it's the space and opportunity to think more locally. I, I think, to be honest, a lot of the things that we're talking about for disinformation and misinformation as we talk about volume, I also think about proximity. Um, and I think having people in the community who you know are practicing in your community, who are invested in care, allowing for opportunities to speak in a more broad format on a local level, I think to you to be helpful. Um, and that's actually, I think, where I feel a little bit more comfortable at this point, speaking to the community that I know that, um, who has, that has barriers that I can anticipate, resources that I can connect to. Right. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to bring back all of our panelists now for a group Q&A based on the questions that we've been receiving. There have been some excellent ones. Okay, so first question. Um, how can we override opinions that were fixed early on, especially at the time it was based on the best available information? Um, basically, what happens when people are done listening after they hear a certain guideline or recommendation? Anyone just chime in? Yeah, masking <laughs> would be a perfect example, right? I mean, and that's the very beginning. For those who are listening who may not have followed the ins and outs of the infection control data on this, the reason why you saw a huge difference and change in recommendation is because all of a sudden it was recognized that this disease could be transmitted when you don't have symptoms. So it's not like you could just know you have symptoms and that's when it will be transmitting. So you can just advise people to stay home. You actually had to advise people to protect themselves and others against this transmission, even when they themselves may not know. That they had an infection, and so that was the that was the change. The other was that I think that there was a lot of you know we weren't ready, we weren't pandemic ready. There weren't enough masks, and at the very beginning, there there was definitely was a struggle of how how many masks you sort of you had for healthcare workers to respond. Because I know this was a struggle everywhere across the country, and and that goes back to why we need to be sort of be ready so we don't get into this position where you have to choose between between populations, right? And, and then it changed, but, and, and, and the way, you know, at least for me, the, the way that I've sort of approached that difference is changes to talk about what changed, to explain what changed in science. What, what has worked against me as a physician, as a scientist talking about this is that there are actually external forces that would say, it, it was like, it was not nuanced as someone else mentioned, I think in conversation where, you know, again, this idea that evidence could change and based on that evidence, you could change your mind because there were external forces that, where like, well, this person lied. How can you ever listen to them about anything else, right? And there, right. there were external forces that were muting my ability to say, well, look, this is what changed and this is why the policy changed. I don't know if others have thoughts on that. Part of it, I mean, look, there's a, we've got all got a cognitive bias to believe the truth of the first thing that we hear. And, you know, it's, I mean, this is why misinformation and disinformation are so terrible, because once a lie gets out there, there's a certain percentage of the population that is simply going to believe it, even once it's debunked. But the good news is that um, it, there was a study in the Nature Human Behavior in June 2019, which provided the first empirical evidence to show that it, you could over, you could debunk, you could overcome um, the uh, bad information. Uh, there, there were several different techniques that they used, and I encourage people to, to read the study by Cornelia Bates and uh, Philip Schmidt. It was really a path-breaking uh, study. But I mean, one 
so Dr. Bedelia, one of the things that, that you said there that sounds uh, so important with masks is not just to change the recommendation, but to tell people why. Because if it's simply just changing what you what they hear, then people fall into that, oh, you know, one time they told me eggs were good, then they say eggs are bad, or, you know, I can't drink coffee anymore, you know, and they just think, well, they're, they're just making it up. But once you pair that with, here's what we learned in the meantime, and here's why we changed our recommendation, I think that goes a lot farther toward convincing people. Great. Aaron, can I just offer sure. one trick that they use in the intelligence community? So in, in the government space, this is a pretty common thing that uh, an intelligence analyst or, or a law enforcement author is very certain about their conviction of what happened or what's going to happen. And so there's always a, a, a situation where this arises. And so the first thing is to challenge them as to whether they're an open-minded person. So they'll always, almost always say yes. And you say, are you an open-minded person? They say, of course I am. And say, okay, under what circumstances would you change your opinion about mask or the vaccine? Because that's telling you what you need to deliver to them to start to shape their perceptions. And our general rule, at least in the government space, if you can't identify um, under what conditions you would change your mind, then you're not an open-minded person. And you're also not going to move. So don't waste your time trying to convince, you know, somebody. Usually, I, I would say the majority of people would say, well, if I saw the following or if I did the following or if so-and-so told me the following, that'll, that'll provide a pathway for you to provide information in that way. And I, I think um, at the beginning, we we're talking about effective communicators. That's kind of what effective communicators do uh, when you watch them over time in terms of disarming, you know, any sort of resistance. I would say that um, personally, I've used that technique for patients and thinking about vaccines. So what would change your mind? And then, you know, they said, for example, you know, FDA approval, I wrote a note on the, on the chart and went back to them and said, hey, uh, you know, how are you feeling about this? Now, I would also say, even though this is more a longer term, um, I, I also think media and medical or health science um, literacy is also a really important component of that, even though it's obviously a longer term strategy here. Um, but when you think about what we've been talking about, what people are consuming in terms of media, the conspiracy theories that exist outside of just medicine or this pandemic, um, there is definitely a great need for um, media training um, and thinking about resiliency in consuming messages. Um, so, you know, really starting pretty far upstream in terms of thinking about this. Following up on the media, we have a few panelists who have very large social media presences and also who appear regularly on television. How do you convey scientific nuance and uncertainty in a very limited character count or a very short few second soundbite on television? Um, well, actually both Cassandra and I and Clint probably can answer this a little bit. I, I do want to say one thing, one thing that I want to mention, somebody else said this a couple of times in the comments, which is to the prior question, people have to be willing to listen to further explanations and once data changes. And I got to, we have to take the, the elephant in the room, which is that part of the reason further messaging stopped being effective, we stopped, we scientists, public health folks stopped potentially being effective is that it, the whole thing took such a political turn. You know, there, in, and not only that, but entire categories or people were just painted with one brush. You know, they're, they're all, if they believe this, they must be blue. If they believe this, they must be red. It became this like a la carte belief menu. You know, if you belong to this party, this is what you believe. And if you belong to this party, rather than what we've been talking about, which is that you can change your mind over time as most, you know, as, as, as we see with science. Um, so to the, to the question that was just asked, it's really hard. You know, I, I think that um, I, I hope I do what part of what Lee said, which was that I, when I speak, I don't speak in absolutes because we don't know. Instead, I speak in probabilities, which is, it is most likely. It is incredibly unlikely. It is exceedingly rare rather than saying, this is the truth. Because we can't at any one point of the data is changing. In, in science, there is all, always a small 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.1, you know, like 0.001% chance that something may change. And we always, we as scientists never want to speak in extremes. The other is, is if, if I change my mind, you know, within that short period of time, uh, or I'm sorry, if science changes within that short period of time, 
I try to focus in on that particular message rather than trying to convey everything in every single appearance. I try to focus on what is the critical piece of information. You know, I don't need to say masking every single time, even I do end up saying that. But today I want to focus on this particular thing because it's going to lead to confusion. And so choosing messages at a time based on what's going on is the other thing that I've, I've had to do because of that short character limit or that short sort of period of time on media. But I'd love to hear what others think. I definitely I'm not a doctor, so I'll let uh, Cassandra go on this one for sure. I can I can be short, but uh, I don't I definitely don't have a, a large social media. I don't uh, kind of hide. Uh, I already have enough time to procrastinate, so I don't do that. Uh, it would be difficult to manage. But um, in the media, you know, I I actually second what you were talking about in terms of choosing messages, Nikid. I view myself as part of a chorus. Um, and so what I, I think about is what is it, the message that I haven't been hearing that is important to hear that is that, you know, that we need to prioritize because I know that they're getting great information from Dr. Bedelia and other colleagues that I have. And so um, I really want to focus on what I think that I, I haven't been hearing um, in, to save that for that, that time point. But yeah, uh, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And, you know, it always feels bad when someone is like prompting you off the show. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I think that, um, yeah, the, the message I haven't been hearing is the one that I usually try to uplift. Great. A uh, next question brought up how distrust can arise when different cities, towns, counties, and states have vastly different guidelines. How can we overcome that? How detrimental is that to trust, especially in as large and fragmented countries as the United States? I, I can speak to that one a little bit, just having watched the response in other countries. And this, this goes for uh, something else I work on, which, which is elections, trust in elections. We have a similar dynamic where every state kind of runs its own elections in, in different ways. And so it's not quite clear what the process is or the outcomes or why uh, judgments are rendered. Um, the answer in short is it's almost impossible to make people feel sure when everyone's making a different decision at a local uh, level. And really, I think federalism has many strengths um, in terms of national responses to, to national things. It, it's painfully difficult uh, to ex execute in a unified way with information. I think you see this with other countries, particularly in Europe, where not only do they kind of have a homogeneous uh, citizenry, they have a government that is much smaller, it's much more easy to manage. And oftentimes people will point and say, the US should do it like them. And I'm like, yeah, all 12 people versus our 300 million people or 400 million. You know, it's, it's much different in terms of scale. And we had much different phenomenon, right? New York City, just population density is a dramatically different scenario compared to, to Montana in terms of how it, how it should, the response should be. So I think the best way to think about it as a messenger in terms of communicating is can you help explain the different variables that are out there and let people be better informed about the decisions that they can make. And so kind of playing on the last question, if, you know, if I have to go on TV or I'm on social media, I'm always looking for analogies that I think can help the audience understand. I mean, aside from pointing everybody to the doctors, which are on this presentation, I'm going to do that first. And I'm going to point to uh, institutions and that information. But can you give them an analogy or a metaphor that helps them understand a, a dynamic situation uh, for them? So I oftentimes are on when there's violent incidents, the information is conflicting or not well known. And so I try and lay, lay out a range of scenarios and then pick just two or three items that help me inform, you know, that I'm looking for to help inform me about which of these scenarios is actually happening. I think that's a helpful way to help the public as well in terms of messaging is here are some things that you should think about. And we've gotten better with it, I think, in terms of age categories and vulnerabilities and things like that. Just help the audience focus on two or three things to help them make a better decision that they feel more secure with and get some the information that can be trusted. Look how much better it's been with the information about the Omicron variant. I'm really impressed. It didn't take that long for the message to be clear and consistent. And uh, I mean, it, it's, it was really a, a model, I think, here uh, recently when you know public health officials said, 
uh, we're going to need two weeks. We haven't, you know, we don't have the data yet. We still got to, you know, do some things. We'll get back to you. Here's what we know so far. Here are the questions we're asking. And then today seemed like a couple of them were resolved. That was terrific. Another question came up about non-peer reviewed studies or preprints and the role that they have in public trust and science. And I'd love to hear from the academics and the non-academics about hmm. what the public should know, why these well, are a good thing in some contexts, but also how to understand the risks and caveats. So, so preprints pre allow your scientific colleagues to uh, weigh in and it makes the final uh, um, study better and you know, get closer to the truth. So I mean, preprints are you know, not a, a leak. They're, they're you know, trying to improve the product. I'm not sure there's much of a public market for preprints. I don't see a lot of the lay public out there, you know, scouring the internet for the preprints on the next set of data on, you know, some scientific question, unless they're cherry picking. And if they're a denier, they are sure to find that one study, which, you know, and maybe they'll go back to the preprint, not the actual published study, which scrubbed out the hypothesis that didn't make it, but they'll go back and they'll quote you the preprint, which had the fact in it that wasn't really a fact that they wanted uh, to use later. So, I mean, preprints, <coughs> preprints are part of science because scientists need to revise what they think on the basis of new evidence and it's uh, and it's part of it but if not seen in the right way i think they can be misleading yeah and uh, i want to step back and say that preprints are pretty new in 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 the field of science and the reason they have become so predominant in this pandemic response is because of the lessons of prior ep epidemics yeah. and in 2013 2016 ebola virus disease epidemic you know the whole question was like look what I started with at the very beginning, if you have a new pathogen, you want to share information about it quickly because you want to make changes to clinical care. You want to, if you found something that you think you should, others should be paying attention to, you know, keeping their ear to the ground about, you want to be able to share that. And in the past, there weren't as many people were waiting. There was this, you know, you should know this is some, some of the, the, you know, the difficult parts of science, right? People wanted to publish their data because they wanted to get credit for it. And so there was a dragging of the feed before you can share the data. And so preprints were this ability to share data that was evolving, but then also for academics and scientists to say, look, this is the methodology that we did it with. This is, this is you know, this is how we sort of present it. Um, but it's, it's, it's an unregulated space. It is not peer reviewed. And, sure. and I actually think and would love to get Clint's thoughts on this. One thing that, you know, Lee was talking about how when you speak, it scares the, the heck out of him. It scares the heck out of me, the, the, the ability of where I see preprints going in the future. Because one example, so aside from the cherry picking and the science deniers, there seems to be an element of almost growing use by disinformation agents yes. of preprints, That's right. of, of taking conspiracy theories, turning them into preprints, uploading them into preprint servers, and then having it be amplified by media, you know, by media agencies. And, and that's why, that's how they come to people's attention. It's when they really get picked up by well-meaning or not well-meaning, you know, information and media agencies um, to try to share that information. That's when public sort of starts to pay attention. And that scares me because it, it's, this is the space that we thought we had created to be able to communicate during outbreaks and to affect patient, you know, patient, um, patient quality of care and things like that. And, and we do want to keep some of it. You know, we may have to introduce like faster peer review before something goes on on preprint servers. But, you know, the weaponization of preprint scares me. So I everything in my world is preprint so because it's Twitter and social media, you know, Facebook. And so I, I always find it uh, interesting. So there are other parallels that are less dangerous to preprints, which is uh, economic forecast and like uh, early returns for businesses and things like that, which are offset with a market. So we went through a period of this um, in the intelligence community after 9-11 uh, and the invasion of Iraq and these sorts of things. And what they did do, which I thought was smart, was they created a market uh, where people evaluated it uh, that were experts, meaning that an assessment comes out or a study comes out or uh, satellite imagery or um, uh, uh, 
a, a bunch of votes, you know, around something. So it was available, but it was to a closed community. And then there was essentially, I don't want to call it a betting market, but think of it as an expert market where they sort of discuss these things. And I noticed, I think Melanie in one of your comments talked about, it's a good opportunity to communicate uncertainty. You will hear this all the time. It's called Bloomberg TV or CNBC, right? It, some, it, there'll be a return that will come in and you will have experts discuss it and then people trade on that market. That's an uncertainty market, right? So the problem with medical stuff is it's instantaneous and people are nervous about it and scared. And so they're making quick and rapid judgments. So I think there are some intricate ways where you could take, for example, in social media, or you could rely on experts. And, and I actually wrote about this for the Central Intelligence Agency about 10 years ago. It was called the wisdom of outliers, which is crowds are really good at understanding things that they've experienced personally or where they have knowledge and when they're decentralized and independent, not Twitter today. And so anything that they don't know about, they're not going to be particularly good at. Disinformation peddlers are priming information now. They're putting in fake bars reports, right? They're making fake studies. They're finding people that aren't doctors to rate fake studies. Because in the world of disinformation, it's false until you make it true. Meaning once you push, you still continue to push evidence to make your outcome appear that way. That's a perception battle. But I think the other thing to think about is, could we take all these doctors who are you know, amazing in this field, create some sort of discussion space that even the public could see to a degree which would allow somebody like me, who's not an expert, right, to kind of have some bearings on it and amplify some perspective on it, or the media and their reporters, right? They're going to jump on anything about COVID right now. Omicron is a great example, right? You saw this turbulence go through the system, but could we structure a place where we can reduce the turbulence and also find better science, you know, at the same time and, and work to that? Uh, like they said, I don't think pre-pubs are going to go away because um, it's very difficult to put something back in once it's come out. But um, in terms of that phenomenon, could we create those dynamics that we see like in business markets where, you know, results will come out, but you have real experts that will come on and, well, there's different ways to think about this, or the results could turn out to be this, or we need more studies before we jump off a cliff. Maybe there's, there's a way to do that. And uh, in, in the business intelligence world, there's a lot of firms that make a lot of money kind of doing that for different clients. So maybe we can just do it for the public in some sort of way. Great. We're out of time, but I would love to hear briefly a sentiment on an upbeat note from each of you about what brings you hope as we approach 2022 with regard to science, the dark chapter of the pandemic and so on. Yeah, I can, I, I will go. Um, <laughs> I'm on a right commitment is first. So um, I, I think the one thing that gives me hope and that I've held on to actually for a few months is the fact that this uncertainty has uncovered a lot um, regarding inequities and bias um, and how we are treating, diagnosing and communicating to structurally marginalized communities. Now, of course, there is also a bit of cynicism there. Um, hope is that we don't pull back on these resources and pull the spotlight back. Um, but we have you know, spoken so much and done so much work in order to look at data um, and think about data for health equity um, and put that the spotlight on that um, and center our conversations on what does the data look like? Um, so thinking a little bit about what science looks like in, ter in terms of equity. Um, there's been so much work funding research in conversations in the space. Um, and so the hope is, is that that will also include continuing conversations about communication, including workforce development, so that we have more scientists, researchers, communicators, people in media um, who are among the most affected group to help influence the dialogue. Yeah, I, I'll just say I'm, it's two years into this pandemic and we have vaccines that are safe. You know, we've been able to find therapeutics and, and sometimes it may feel like we're back to square one every time you hear about a new variant or something else or, or even the challenges like, you know, getting vaccines to everybody around the world, which seems like a long uphill battle ahead of us. But look at what we accomplished, kicking and fighting, you know, and, and yes, a lot of costs along the way. I don't know if you can still hear me, my, my AirPods are dying in my ear. Um, 
But like, it's incredible how we came together as a global community, despite a lot of the things that we've talked about today, the challenges, the fast moving sort of scene, um, to be able to share that data. And, and then that makes us stronger, I think, because we are in an age of epidemics. We've changed the environment around us. And so we're gonna continue to see epidemic threats in the future. But also, you know, I, I, what I hope it's done is help us identify new questions we need to answer, including the issue of, around equity, but also around disinformation, misinformation, new challenges that we scientists need to take to, into integration as we're thinking about pandemic preparedness. Clint, I'll go next so you can go last if you yes. like. So <laughs> one thing that's made me optimistic recently is to realize that uh, this is not this may not sound like reason to be optimistic, but I think it is, that it's not really one problem, it's three. There's the creation of disinformation, there's the amplification of disinformation, and there's the uptake of disinformation. And we don't have to just work on the third side. We've spent so much time thinking about how to work on the third problem. And in a way, the folks who are believing lies, disinformation, are victims and they deserve our empathy. And if we can figure out how to, you know, not let the polarization see, you know, skeptics, disbelievers, you know, even when they're angry and, you know, holding signs and, uh, you know, even threatening, to understand that they're being duped and that there's something that we can do about that, not just by talking to them, but by doing some of the things that uh, Clint was talking about, working on deplatforming the disinformers, and making the algorithms um, of the social media companies more public, because I think that the opacity of those algorithms is part of what's made the situation worse. And once, if Congress does one thing to regulate social media, I think it should be to make the uh, company's algorithms more available to academic researchers so that we don't have to wait for a whistleblower to tell us what the harms are. I think that that is the pinch point where we'll really be able to do something about this problem. I'll go uh, uh, real quick, which is, I think the younger generation behaves better in the information environment than the older one. And that's uh, been a positive to learn. I've got to work with a really great team of young people uh, over the last couple of years. They are super bright and smart. They come up with great ideas. Uh, it used to be, your parents were the example for you. And it's kind of been interesting to watch how they've been the example for me. And I think a lot of the older generation that's not been so great in the information environment. So I'm, I'm pretty positive about a lot of these things. They've solved the, I mean, one of the most amazing stories I saw in the pandemic was a, a restaurant that was going under because they lost all their customers and a kid made an app for his own dad and became like the hottest selling business. I mean, this is amazing, right? Like, so I, I am very optimistic that many of the problems we're having right now in the information environment will improve because the younger generation has grown up on technology and they're pretty savvy about a lot of these things. Thank you for all of those thoughts and for sharing your time, experience, and expertise with everyone today. On behalf of the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program and the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases and P Policy and Research at Boston University, thank you so much for attending. We did record this. It'll be on YouTube either later today or tomorrow, and I'll send out the link to all the registrants. And this was the first collaborative event between SEED and the Aspen Institute Science and Society Program. So please be on the lookout for future programming from us. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you.